Kelly mentioned, my name is Tracy Timmy. I'm the new Dean of Business. Um, so my office is in 10401. And we've really done a number of programming events this semester to benefit you guys, hopefully. And you can give us, give me your feedback, whether you like it, hate it, what a waste of time, pizza was good, whatever. Um, so we have, this is a kickoff of our speaker series. So we have a fine panel assembled um, in the chef's coat. You might expect is Chef Damon. Um, Damon Giancola is an executive chef and has one of the top tier catering trucks um, called Mr. D's Nomadic Kitchen. If you are a culinary student, you probably got a tour of that truck. How many people got a tour? Raise your hand. Okay. Um, and Chef Damon does festivals, private parties, um, various food truck events. Um, if you're not living in a cave, you realize that food trucking is becoming all the rage um, in the culinary area. So we're very happy to have him. Um, chef number two, right on schedule, is um, Chef Skylar Bird. Skylar was had the distinguished honor to be one of my students, of course. Um, in business law, and he operates his own restaurant in New Hope on McCann Street called Cafe Blue Moose. Cafe Blue Moose is a youth-run restaurant, and everybody who works there is somewhere between the ages of 15 and what are we topping out out now? 22. Like 28. 28. Okay. You're old. So, <laughs> um, and he's here to talk about how you get started in that kind of uh, business. He was very entrepreneurial from a very young age, ran a supper club, get this, out of his parents' house um, for a number of years. So he has very nice parents. Um, Gino, I'm going to kill this, the Shriver, okay, comes to us from Eat This Yum, which is part, it's a multi-generational family that creates artisan food products based here in Bucks County. Um, he, again, is going to talk to you about how you get your own business started, some of the um, pitfalls, what you have to look at in terms of product packaging, working with a family owned business. I worked with my dad for a number of years. It's good and it's bad, and I'm sure Gio can shed some light well, on that. I'm the only family member working there, so. So, oh. <laughs> That's so easy. You got rid of all of them? <laughs> That's how you solved the problem. <laughs> if you're in a family run business, eliminate all families. Okay. Um, Bob Tkachki is here from One Cup Joe. How many people drink coffee? Raise your hand high. Okay. How many people know what one of these is? Okay. One Cup Joe is, um, there are two locations currently with a few more in the works. And when you go into the store, there is a wall of One Cups. So you can get 24 of whatever variety you like. You don't have to commit to just one brand that you hope you like it. Um, you can choose whatever you like. Um, he's going to discuss his career path, what brought him to being an entrepreneur from a larger company, and also the phenomenal growth of his company that has only been up and running maybe 18 months. Less than that. Yeah. So from concept to um, where it is now, it, sales have been absolutely phenomenal. And finally, from SCORE, we have Anthony Kennedy. Um, SCORE is a service course of retired volunteers, and they work with entrepreneurs to start and run their own company. They have locations in Bucks, and they have expertise in hiring in small business and understanding what people need to get hired. Um, Free service, low cost? Vol volunteers giving a free service nationwide. Okay, so if you're thinking after this, which I'm sure you will just be very excited about being entrepreneurial, um, there is a handout for the eight classes that you must take if you want to be entrepreneurial. Um, lucky for me, <laughs> most of them are in my department, so <laughs> come on over. Um, if you're interested in small business management or culinary as a major, we have that and I have handouts for that as well, or you can just stop by and see myself or Professor Luce or Chef Arrowood, and we can give you some more information on that. So um, that's my 
speech. So I will turn it over to the panel, and I'm sure you have many questions based on what you've already been told. Um, did you guys want to just give a brief kind of overview of your career path and why you're here, and then we'll open up for questions? Yeah. If that's all okay? Okay. Right. Again, my name is Bob Scotchy, and uh, I'm the owner of One Cup Joe. Um, and I started in the coffee industry in general, probably when I was 14. Coffee related, you know, vending machines and people like that. I used to work after school, you know, under the table, and then eventually you know, working papers. But you know, I started learning uh, the service, the service angle of. Of, of coffee distribution, and eventually, uh, you know, I took a, a position with a company called uh, Van Hoot, which also owns Filter Fresh, which is a service company, and uh, I worked my way up through the ranks, pretty much from uh, warehouse, forklift driver, sales, um, operations management, um, to eventually uh, a regional vice president, and then uh, my next position since it was kind of like a dead end. I couldn't go any higher, really, with the, the, the vice president uh, regional for, for that company. I decided to go with a privately owned company where I was the president, president of that company for, for seven years. So, you know, pretty much I had to work my way up through the ranks, and, and, and it really helped me long term because I was able to gain a little bit of knowledge of all these different aspects of the business. You know, sales, uh, very important. You know, I, I'm not a graphic designer, but I spent a lot of time in, in, with the marketing department. Um, from managing 54 drivers, um, you know, so it all pretty much, uh, you know, helped out. So while I was the, the president of a privately owned coffee company, I formed two companies. One of them was called CoffeeRocket.com, and the other one was Philly Bean Coffee. They were some there were some partnerships involved with that, and uh, eventually, you know, they, both the businesses were, were pretty successful. We sold them off and uh, started, uh, you know, One Club Joe. Basically, I had a dream, 2009. I wanted to start something new, something that was never done before, um, with K-Cups. Um, it's the fastest growing product, coffee product, you know, coffee related product that's selling in this country today. But I started selling this in 1995 when no one ever knew about it, to businesses mainly, you know, and uh, maybe some folks that had some disposable income. It's not the cheapest method of making your morning cup of joe, right? So something like this can run you anywhere from 59, to 59 cents to $1.79 just for one of these just to use in your machine at home. Um, so we started selling them in uh, 1995 to uh, businesses. As time went on, you sold the big box stores, Targets, and things like that. They started selling these. Next thing you know, the, the end consumer at home was starting to gobble these things up. So I decided that, uh, you know, what if I could get, what if I could get into that arena direct? You know, we were selling online, but, you know, you had to buy a certain quantity, buy the box, or if you didn't like it, what are you going to do with it? It's going to sit in your pantry. So 2009, I, came up with this concept of basically a mix and match, or buy whatever you want. So created a specialty store or a place where you could go in and, and just basically try all these different you know, new, new coffees or anything you might like, uh, you know, and you weren't forced to buy 24 or 16 or 12 as you come at the grocery store. We, we provide the, you know, probably the best pricing per cup, the widest uh, variety in the country, except for maybe one company in Houston. And uh, it's just, uh, it's interesting to see how people have really taken to it. You know, it's a, it was a big gamble because how I'm up against every big player that's out there. Sam's Club, you know, Walmart, things like that. They all sell this product. So how, how am I going to make it, you know? So we decided to, you know, create a brand, uh, create a culture, um, you know, that, that we wanted to sell it the way we wanted to do it. And to see people come and have to come in flocks. So, you know, right now, you know, One Cup Joe has uh, two locations. We have three that are being currently either signed, signed on or being built. We have a test run with the military service. We have our own private label brand that launches at the end of October as well, as you'll be able to see on shelves. And uh, we're also in early discussions of possible franchise. So um, we started one, the actual One Cup Joe retail locations, which is only one of our four divisions, last September, and we have done $2.1 million in sales since that point in time. So we're expecting big things, and uh, it doesn't come without a lot of dedication and hard work and a lot of uh, emotional kind of roller coaster, you know, ride. But, you know, I think if you, you learn from your mistakes and you stick to some of the basics and you, and, you, and you listen to other people and take some of what they got to offer, and 
you know, have good people around you, which is the key, I think you can, you can make it. So, pretty much lost it. Okay. So, next. All right. <laughs> Okay, well, my name is Skylar Bird, and I started working in restaurants when I was 11. Don't tell the Pennsylvania Department of Labor. Um, <laughs> I got my first kitchen job when I was 13. Um, never really saw it as a career for me, because, uh, I don't know, high-stress environment. I didn't like being yelled at all the time. Um, I actually graduated from Bucks, um, up a Bucks alum, with a cinema, uh, what is it, Associates in Cinema. Um, when I was about 16, that's when I kind of switched gears and said, you know what, maybe restaurants aren't such a bad thing after all. Um, I got pretty excited about what I was doing. Um, I spent uh, about a year and a couple months over in France, uh, living over there. Um, I was able to get a job working at a little restaurant over there, uh, which is very inspiring. Um, so uh, that kind of motivated me when I came back to the States. I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to... Uh, try and look for some kind of culinary program that I can get myself into. And uh, when I was 16, I moved to Manhattan, um, graduated from the French Culinary Institute in 2010, and started working for Union Square Hospitality Group in New York City, um, where I worked for about a year before moving back to good old Bucks County, because Bucks County is a lot less stress than being a line cook in Manhattan. Well, a little bit less stress. Um, so to make my life even more stressful, I um, came across a location in New Hope, Pennsylvania that was, um, I don't want to say, well, it was feasible, let's put it that way. Um, I was able to get enough money to um, acquire the location. The real estate market was at its like absolute lowest point. Um, so about a year later, um, I opened the doors of the Blue Moose, which is our 40 seat restaurant that we have. Um, I've had it for three years now, um, as of this week, actually. Um, and it's been a lot of fun, um, there's been a lot of laughter, a lot of tears, and uh, it's uh, been overall a good experience, um, but there's definitely been a lot of uh, learning going along the way, both in terms of food and menu, but even more so in terms of um, business, in terms of customer service, and in terms of uh, people management, which is something that I had never really gotten into before. But, uh, you know, as of right now, we have 16 employees, um, some of whom speak English, some of whom don't, um, and uh, you know it creates an interesting dynamic. Um, but uh, we all try and have fun the best we can along the way. Uh, the business has been doing okay so far. Our first year was a little rocky, but the second couple of years have been a solid build, and uh, we're hoping to continue to build from here on out. So, that's about it. My name is Gino DeShriver. I have a company called Eat This, and I basically make savory jams and marmalades that sell at farmers markets and also wholesale. Um, and this is my second business. Um, the first time around was a couple of years ago in 2000. I started in 2004, and it was a uh, dinners to go business in um, Nevada. And the reason I bring up that story is because it failed, and um, I think of some of the reasons it failed was um, my own doing and also a combination of the um, market falling in 2008 and us losing a huge um, share of customers because a lot of our customers were involved in the real estate market, either building, they were realtors, they were um, um, title company employees. And although I was doing really well for the first two years, I grew tremendously too big too fast, and that was one of the big mistakes I made. And so the second time around, I decided, although I was scared to start over again, um, I wanted to try it again, but this time take a different approach to starting my own business, and that was slow and small. And I also wanted to um, give back to the community, and um, the first thing I did was I became a volunteer firefighter in a community that I live in Upper Bucks County, and uh, the second thing I did was approach them because there was a commercial kitchen at the firehouse that I needed to get my hands on because I didn't have the capital to build a new kitchen. And um, I went to um, our members and 
gave them this idea that I wanted to start this business and give back a percentage of my sales back to the firehouse. Um, that did two things. It made me feel really good, and it's also a really great marketing tool. Because customers love to hear about giving back to the community. Um, it's been a rocky road. This is where it's less than, it'll be three years in November. The first year was really tough um, because having failed the first time around, and having to have filed bankruptcy, no bank's going to touch you for a really, really long time. So um, I started with a very small amount of money, went to one farmer's market, and today we are um, selling at six farmer's markets, and we are in 60 stores nationwide. Um, that's all I got. <laughs> My name is Damon Giancola. I'm the executive chef at St. Francis Medical Center in Trenton. I'm also chef, co-owner, and operator of Mr. D's Nomadic Kitchen. Um, I got into cooking at a very early age, decided that in 2009 I was going to do something that only a few people had started thinking about and doing and outside of Philadelphia, which was having a food truck business. I started the actual business in 2010. And with all the ups and downs and everything like that, and dealing with health department codes, regulations, licensing, fees, and all that, finally got my business up and running a year later. It's three years into it now, and we're just starting to show that the business can pay for itself. First two years, I took losses in the mid five figures, and a lot of this money comes out of my own pocket. I have really no financial backers or any financial people helping me out, I do it all myself. My wife and I own and operate the business. And I, I said earlier, I do festivals, fairs, anywhere that will let me park my trailer, I will park, open up and sell food. It's, um, it's a hard business. It's a fun business. Um, don't let the glamour of the TV shows and the movies fool you. It's nothing what you like to see on TV. Oh, come on, Gino. <laughs> <laughs> they want all, all the good food. You don't scare them off. <laughs> no, there is no scaring off, but it is a costly event. It is a costly venture. Um, the average food truck business, they'll say, will cost you anywhere between forty dollars and $60,000 for the truck alone. I can tell you right now, I'm probably including food, supplies, uh, marketing, menu development, the vehicle, the trailer, the kitchen itself, I'm probably close to about $200,000 in it. So, but would I trade it for anything else? No, I love it. It's what I do, it's what I love to do, and I'll continue to do it. I'm hoping to get the Geno status one day, and, you know, market some of my things that I make, but we'll talk later about that. <laughs> uh, I'm Tony Kanicki. I graduated from Penn State University in hotel management, restaurant management, hotel management. And uh, six months out of Penn State, I bought my own restaurant and started my business. I bought a little 40-seat diner in Bucks County, and over the next years, took it to 180 seats with 35, 40 employees, open 24 hours a day, doing business. We did business. We sold a lot of food. We used to roast over 600 pounds of turkey a week. We'd roast them all night so they'd be nice in the morning, take them out of the ovens. And Everything was as fresh and good like that. We had very high standards at our level, at our price point. But the reason I say all that is because I'm indicative of the kind of men and women you'll find at an organization called SCORE. We're retired business people, mostly, who help and want to help other people start their own business. There's 50 of us in Bucks County. We're a free service. We love what we do. These 40, 40 to 50 men and women have skills all over the map in all kinds of businesses. So we're here for you when you have a question, when you feel down, you just want to talk to somebody. Hey, I talked to somebody, I'm so worried about this. Okay, that's the kind of thing we offer. Plus, business plans, leads to financing, stuff like that. And my specialty, what I like to do, is I like to do business avoidance. Making mistakes early in the game that'll take you down two or three years later. 
And then my other thing I really like to do is cost control. We used to do weekly food and beverage costs and labor costs in my restaurant every single week, 52 weeks a year. In two weeks, I thought, something's not right here. Uh, I don't know what's not right, but my figures are telling me it's not right. And I'd start walking around the kitchen. Where's the butter? I can't find the butter. Who did what with the butter? Just to create an atmosphere that people knew I was watching and caring. So uh, that's what SCORE has to offer you. We have pamphlets on your way out. We'd love to help you if we can. Thank you very much. Not all at one time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, well, I teach Spanish here, so I have nothing to do with this. But my husband's background is, is publishing. He's worked in publishing for 30 years. And like this gentleman, he started out driving a truck, and he worked retail, and he's done the New York thing, the executive thing, and all that. Now he's part of a consulting group, because we know this printed work is mostly digital now, and it's a greatly changing business. He's a fabulous natural cook, but he has one product, his chicken is just amazing. I know I'm his wife, but we have some very discriminating friends and they love his chicken. He marinates it, he roasts it outside, he has a special way he slices it with just the right knife and everything else. And I want him to market this because everyone likes this chicken. From someone who eats at McDonald's and someone who eats at fine restaurants. I don't know how to get him help. He couldn't be here today. I tried to get him. So, anyway, your booklet, baby. Well, from my point, of, my point of view, take a pamphlet, please, and call the office, and he can make an appointment. We'd love to meet with him. And he should specify he's interested in marketing, so he doesn't get an accountant, you know what I mean, or he doesn't get an engineer, and he wants help marketing. Okay. Thank you. My question is, after I graduate, I'm looking into my long-term book being both a caterer and a nonprofit chef. Do you guys like give any advice on becoming a nonprofit and stuff like that? Uh, I haven't really dealt much with nonprofit organizations. Okay. Um, the most nonprofit organization I deal with now is Meals on Wheels. I'm a chef for them out of Trenton, out of the hospital. <laughs> Um, it's a great organization. I thoroughly enjoy it. There's a lot of constraints you have to deal with, a lot of dietary constraints. Um, but it, it's still very rewarding mm -hmm. doing, doing that. But like I said, it is part of my job description of being in the hospital. So uh, a lot of stuff that I don't use or that I can't use, I donate to the Mercer County Food Bank. Why are you limiting that? Why do you yeah, want to be a chef in a non-profit? Because right now that's what I do. I feed the community every Sunday. Oh, okay. So, that type of non-profit. Yeah. Oh, okay. So okay. I just want to sure. be legal so I can get more donations and how I can go about being a non-profit. Well, the legality to... comes from the organization, not from you. Okay. Right? <laughs> Unless you're the organization's head. Or the board of right. That's what, as long as you have your Bucks County certificate, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you have or will get, you know, your food handling certificate, you must have that, yes. what you're doing here. You're legal. You're, you're, there's, the legal the legality is about the organization, not you. Okay. Yeah. I would uh, consider talking to God's Love to Deliver in New York City. Um, I work for them a little bit on my days off. Mm -hmm. um, they do meals mostly for people with terminal illnesses, but they're huge hugely successful I mean, kitchen. I don't even know how many thousands of square feet it is. But um, there's a lot of really nice people over there and I'm sure there'd be, you know, somebody would probably talk to you about uh, what kind okay, of legalities. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. You have a day off? <laughs> 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 That's a long time ago. <laughs> we had another question. Um, so besides having like a really good business plan to go to to take the people, how do you recommend getting investors and getting them interested in your business and convincing them, besides that you have a plan, that you're somebody worth investing in? You have to be passionate about it. 
you really have to, when you go after money or you're trying to go after money for people to give to you, you have to be very passionate about what you want to do. You have to sell that product or item or whatever to who you, I had to sell the idea of my food truck to my few investors that were able to help me out. Because let's face it, not everybody wants to give that kind of money that you need. So you really have to come up with a really good business plan. You have to believe in what you do. You have to sell that person on that. Those are the three key items right there. Have you heard about crowdsourcing? Yes. On the internet routes to like personal funding? Yeah, there's like probably that. several yeah. different companies doing that. I think also you, you have to make sure that your personal credit's intact. You know what I mean? Yes. It's, it's a big part of it. Too. I mean, there's a lot of people that have these, you know, that want to go ahead and do things. They have the desire to do it, but they've made mistakes in the past that they're paying for now. It makes it very difficult for, for others to trust their money with you when you've shown that you haven't been responsible with your own. So I, to me, that's a, that's a really big piece uh, initially. And depending on where you're trying to get your, 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 your funds from, you know, there's a, a wider range like the open cloud sourcing, or there's a local aspect to it, whether it's people you may know personally who may be a little bit more lenient, may not give as much, but you know, believe in you, know you, know your passion. You know, because there's a personal aspect to it. When we go, when we step outside of that, we're just another person in a body, and then your business plans are matched up with someone else's business plans. And where do I want to put my money if I don't know you matter? So I mean, there's a different way. That, you know, there's different ways to to acquire. You know, some of the funding. A business plan obviously is really important, but it's not everything. I mean, I can go home, you know, write another business plan tomorrow for something completely different. Maybe none of it was my idea at all. You know, with the internet today, anybody can create. Anything. Most small business in, business funding comes from family and friends, yeah, right. mm -hmm. by far. Because yeah. banks aren't really too interested at all. They don't want to talk to you. You could also uh, start a relationship with your local credit union because those tend to be a little bit more lenient or easy to get. get. personal loan too. Exactly, as, that opposed is to a, as opposed to a big bank. And we yeah. have a credit union here on campus. <laughs> <laughs> Your credit is called Truemark. <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's actually to a, Talk a little bit more about it. You know, I'll give you a little more details about our situation. You know, even though we've had we have years of experience with our current bank uh, under a different business, was successful. You know, I have great credit. Uh, I pay all great. Uh, you know, there's everything looks good. Balance sheet's good. Financial statements great. Right? But because it's still less than a year, you know, the business, you know, or a year's time, they still follow their rules. There's still an underwriter somewhere else that doesn't know you, doesn't really know your, you know, doesn't have that relationship with you, and you know. It's, still, it's very hard to get the funding these days. So that's why I say the first and foremost, as far as your own personal credit situation, don't, do not expect to rely on banks because trust me, they are not, you know, I don't know what kind of money you're gonna be going after, but I know that you know, it's just not easy at all um, you know, right now. So but that's the way it's to use your own money. Well, that's what I think I've done, and it sounds like that's what, yeah, that's what I've done. Yeah, I pretty much reinvested everything that I have, um, believing in what, what we're doing. Um, and even to this point, you know, the business is doing really well, but I really don't pay myself that much at all. Uh, I have put it back into the infrastructure and into the employees, and I'm, I'm playing for the long-term player. Because the other thing, really, do you really want to start out your business with debt? Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's not, you know. That's, that's one of our biggest objectives. It was one of our biggest objectives right. going into the new business was to have zero debt for as long as we could possibly do it. And to this day, we still have zero debt. It's uh, it's very very important, and I'm not saying it's easy to do, but it's a big goal for us. And I don't know, you know, as we continue to grow, you know, moving forward, you know, how much we decide to take on. I'm not quite sure I can stay out of just being totally debt free. At some point in time, you might need that partnership to take you to the next level. You know, but so. then you are in a good position. What, what, so if you start yeah. with your own money two three years into it, and then you want to expand, and now you're at a good place and a good position, if everything's good go to a financial institution and say, hey, you know, this is where I'm at, this is where I'd like to go, can you help me from point A to point B? Did you say you wanted to be a caterer? Um, I want to do a dessert truck. Oh, a dessert truck? A dessert oh. truck. Oh, like your kind of truck. Like Drive it around truck. So, okay, yeah. good. Just don't park in this. <laughs> 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 you might have a little conflict of interest. <laughs> Uh, do you think there's a market for just that one item on a menu that calls dessert? I mean, one. Well, it depends on what you do with it. I mean, there's so many different options with dessert. You can do savory dessert, sweet dessert, mix and match. I mean, mm -hmm. things that weren't thought of as dessert a couple years ago 
our desserts now. I mean, you can do like. Um, Where do you see your market? I um I honestly wanted to go into Philadelphia. My mom works at a hospital down there, and one thing that I've heard from her and a lot of her coworkers is that, especially on weekends, there's nowhere to get anything. There's like a taco place, and that's it. Nothing right. within reason. And a lot of times, they can't travel far from campus because they're hospital staff. Secondary markets after that one. What do you mean by well, where else? Where else? Where after? else would I go? Yeah. Uh, college uh, campuses, if I yeah, could. Good, good. Um, I mean, near, near bars, honestly, after right. about two. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Especially on the my purpose was my purpose was to investigate your thinking. Yeah. To see that the breadth of your thinking, how wide you're looking, which I really like, it increases your chance of success enormously. You're not so, oh, I'm going to go ninth and time and be successful. Yeah. Right, you know what I mean? What I'm saying? Yes. Go. Oh, there's one back. If I can oh. play devil's advocate, yeah, sure. Of course. Part it's... of my job structure here. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I just need to say this just to play devil's advocate. Okay. No offense, but chicken is chicken. Oh. Coffee is coffee. A food truck is a food truck. Part of the major concern I think most entrepreneurs have. Yes, we have spirit. Yes, we have uh, a, a wonderful idea, but if you cannot differentiate it, if you cannot separate it from the mainstream, I guarantee you, because of the advent of internet and media gratification, you will fail. Well, and I can speak a little bit to that. I, I, wa I want you to actually, I'm directing it kind of you, because okay. I'm all about <clears throat> jellies and okay. jams. There's a, there's a bucket load of those things out there. So How do you differentiate okay. sugar and pectin and fruit? Right. So the first thing, the first thing I well, the first thing I did was I knew that I wanted to make a product that yes, there's a gazillion different ones out there, but there were a couple of things that I wanted mine to be different. I wanted it to be more fruit than what you get at the store. I wanted to use less or no pectin and less sugar. The other component was a container. I didn't want it to look like any other. When you go to a grocery store, you walk past an aisle and they're all the same jar. They might be a different shape, but they're all pretty much the same jar. And it took me about a year and a half to find the right jar. And I use a jar called, the, uh, it's WEC, but it's actually pronounced VEC. It's a VEC jar. It's a German glass jar. Old, it's an old masonry jar with glass lid, rubber gasket, and it looks very different. And it's the first thing that people gravitate to when they see is that the farmer's market or we just did the uh, specialty food show at the Javits Center where people from all over the world come it's uh, to trade only and that's what people came up because of the, the visual effect of the product. The reason, I, the reason I bring this up is because if you can differentiate a container like a jar, something yeah. like a jar, I as a consumer say yes this is really pretty, it's very nice, it's very elegant, I look at the bottom, the price point's okay. The product of the sample I just tasted, because you want to be able to give something right. for free. But then, as a consumer, right away, I say, What can I do with this jar after I'm done with the jelly? Well, the jar is at our markets are, re are returnable. We give them a discount on future purchase. Mm -hmm. Or the jar can be reused. It's almost like a, um, like a Tupperware mm -hmm. jar, so it can be reused. I'm sorry, um, if you yeah. want to see the jar, it is in the display case outside the library. Oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is there. And yes, I can attest, I did get attracted to the product. I was in the Doylestone Farmer's Market, I saw the sign, and then I saw the jars. Uh, I was yeah. very curious about that jar and great price point. Well, I have to say, I'm not cheap. My product is very expensive. Sure. And because I use quality fruit. I don't use second class fruit. I use a lot of fruit and it, it costs more money to make and I'm not going to make any excuses about it. And the people that our customers understand that and they they are repeat customers. There are, you're not going to be able to make everybody happy. And just like with coffee, there's people that are going to go, oh, I'm not paying a dollar seventy for an old cartridge or, you know. But if you want 100% to make a Blue Mountain, you'll pay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you want quality, you have to pay for quality. That's my philosophy. I just want so. to add one thing to that. 
But, you know, um, not to get into the coffee situation, coffee, coffee, because we are very unique. No one really does what we do. That's a whole separate issue. That's well, the reason why I am able to I know that for right? absolutely. Sure. So the, 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 what I would say is, and this other, I, I don't know how this kind of goes with the folks that are trying to, that are in uh, culinary arts or they're trying to open restaurants, but for us, you know, when I think about the model that I, that I wanted to build, wait, you know, I said, look, I want to do it this way. I also think of, the, I look at it like the short term, middle, you know, middle ground and the long term play, right? I, I always look at that, but I also look at the risk and then my fallback position. Yep. So I have to include all this stuff when I'm looking at everything, right? It, but I also, in, in all that, I say, okay, well, I wanted to create additional channels of revenue, or revenue sources, right? Because to me, that's a safety, it's like a safety net. So, you know, it helps build your overall foundation. So it, I don't know how that kind of relates to a restaurant, but I know for what we do, you know, I said, okay, look, we, we're in the retail, especially retail. Okay, that's great, but what if X happens? It's gone, right? Okay, so how do I protect that? Okay, well, I'm also gonna do the office coffee service and refreshment businesses, which is, you know, services that kind of, uh, you know, I don't have to worry about trends. Whatever's new, I'm offering it, right? So that's more the foundation. I opened the wholesale division, your e-commerce division. So what you try to do is, you know, you can peel away all this stuff, but basically, I'm trying to protect the house in case something happens, like like the stock market, program, that I can, you rely on other revenue streams to help us get through. I'm not saying certain people might lose their jobs, unfortunately, or I may take a pay cut, or whatever it is, but we're gonna survive, and we're gonna learn from it, and we're, we're gonna move forward. So it's important to always look at, not don't, don't just be, you know, have this one mindset, I'm gonna make money this, this way, and go so fast and hard at it, so you forget to really take in and some, some of these other smaller opportunities and take what you can get. I, I have experience with doing a lot of business with you know, big business, and trust me, when you, it's never a safe play to have, let's say, you know, 40% of your revenue locked up with one client, okay? Trust, when they go out of business, you're, you're gonna hurt. So and you have to kind of diversify the first, the first yourself and be, be involved in, in, in different mm -hmm. areas. Absolutely, and I, I somewhat diversified where I also took on um, a co-packing job for somebody else. So I'm making somebody else's jam. My name's not attached to it, but it's just another opportunity for me to have cash flow, and it's easy breezy. I make it, I drop it off, they pay me. So, you know, you always have to, be open to other opportunities. Okay. So, for um, you said that you like you know start small and mm -hmm. go slow. And um, I guess my question is really like, when do you start picking up the pace? And then also, you said you were giving back to the community a certain percentage. Uh, was that really hard to you know like what like keep? profiting for yourself but did that well, affect you no because the more the more money I make the more I, I'm giving the, the percentage doesn't change so the, right. the more money I make the more I'm giving to back to the firehouse and honestly it's still a lot less than if I were to either rent a kitchen or build a kitchen so at this point it's still very good on my side now this might change as the business grows and then maybe you know at that point there has to be a discussion, there has to be a cap. Um, as far as slow growth, and that, I'm just speaking for me, that, yeah, you know, no. that might be different for the other members of the panel. I just learned from the first time around that I grew so fast that I just lost the grip on the actual business, and then I didn't see the issues that were popping up. This time, you know, I just started really small, and I grew, and I'm growing gradually. It's picking up a little steam now, but I, I've also learned to say no to certain stores that they don't fall within a certain parameter, that I feel my product needs to be in a certain display or a certain department, um, I'll say no. So, um, you know, I could have done the food show two years ago. I wasn't ready, because I knew once I do the food show, I'm gonna get a lot of interest. So I waited until I felt I was ready to take on that challenge. Mm -hmm. No, I was operating a single unit, just one restaurant, and we let the customers push us into expansion. When the place got so busy, people couldn't get in anymore, I made an, a, you know, I had maybe 30, 40 percent. And then when that happened four years later, I did it again. See? So by the time we expanded, the business was waiting. Okay? Yeah, that's fine. Cool. You'll know. You'll make it. Yeah. Yeah, it'll, it'll talk to you. Yeah, it'll, 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 it'll tell you. It'll talk. Yes. Yeah. And you'll make mistakes with it too, and then you'll learn from the previous one what you can handle or not handle. I right. think that's really yeah. important. You will make mistakes. There's no way that you're not going to make mistakes. Yeah. The, the, the challenge is you need to learn from them. If you make the same mistake twice, that's not good. <laughs>
Christian. Why did you go with jams and jellies? Is, like, is it a passion or did you see an opportunity? Um, honestly, well, I've been in the food industry my entire life. Okay. I grew up in Europe. My dad's a chef. Um, but, and I was a private chef for a long time. I, I've done it all. But the jams and jellies really was born from, um, believe it or not, growing too many tomatoes in my garden one year, and I didn't know what to do with them. <laughs> and I made tomato marmalade, and that's what started it. And then um, I didn't really think about it that much. And then a couple of years later, I was in a really terrible corporate job that I hated. And I thought, I'm going to start making jam. And, uh, but I wanted to make it more savory. So the jams that I make and marmalades are really more to be served with cheese or also to be used in cooking. So, which that in itself has brought its own challenge because we continuously are educating our customer that, hey, it's not just to put on toast and yeah. bread. And I hear it all the time, and oh, you know, my fridge is full of jelly. And I tell them, well, you can use it for, you can make salad dressings out of it. You can do all sorts of things with it. So that has really helped. Are you doing it by yourself? I am, yes, I, well, I have one full-time and one part-time right now, but mostly I'm the one making it, yeah. yeah. Um, when building your own business, how do you keep your, uh, your own like, personal assets afloat? Like, I know you put a lot what of your... assets? Yeah. Well, yeah, no, no. <laughs> like, I know you put a lot of your own money into your business when starting out, but um, like, how do you sustain, like, you know, like if you're living on your own, how do you pay for your, your bills and stuff? That's the beauty about having your own business. Yeah, so. that, I, mean, I think about it all the time. Yeah. Just because how much have I, I've invested into it. Um, but also, you know, I'm older now, but when I was, you know, a little bit more aggressive when I was a little younger, you know, I didn't have children, you know. Um, I was willing to go a little further, a little deeper <laughs> into the pocket, yeah, to make sure that it happened. But I think that that's probably... You know, I know, you know, I kind of have an idea in my head of where the line is drawn, okay, of where I'm willing to go. I mean, I have options on top of that as far as if I think that I need to take on an investor, then to help me out with some of this, then I may do that. But, it, you know, I, at some point in time, you have to realize whether you're all in or not. Because if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're a little hesitant on how dedicated you are to the business, then there's a good chance you probably won't make it. In a lot of cases, if you want to, you want to create your own business and, have, and make it successful in the long term, um, you need to be all in and all in with everything. Are you asking uh, how much you can pay yourself? I'm asking like he, how you can continue to pay your bills while you're trying to. Yeah. You know, well, I want to differentiate between jobs. paying your bills and paying yourself, and which question were you asking, or both? I feel like you have to have a certain amount of income to, um, to you know, keep a living, like the way that you want to. Uh, would you, like I'm saying, would you have to cut back on that income a little bit and put well, more into the business? Your, your life comes from your business. Yeah. And your checkbook and your profit and loss statement will show you what's available to take, if any. So would you go into debt to start your business and take that I, chance? I would not. I would. I would. I did. Okay. Yeah. I have to <laughs> Tell them how many hours a week you do in your real job. In my real job, I work 60 to 70 hours a week. And then I put in another, depending on what I have coming up, like I have four festivals coming up four weeks in a row starting this Saturday. I'll put in another six hours a day up until the day of the festival. And the day of the festival, I'll put in another 12 hours. So that's so, the passion you're talking about. Yeah, it's the passion you're talking about. Do I receive a paycheck for my business now? Everything I earn goes right back into the business. It becomes a, it's, it's, it's a way of living. It's, it's how you... That's your life. That's it's why all in your mind. Right. That's why I have yeah. another full time it, job. Yeah. So I can pay my bills. <laughs> Sometimes my kids get their dreams. Yeah. Still. So yeah. my business right now is actually just getting to the point where it can start paying its bills for itself yeah. without it coming out of my pocket. For the three years prior, I was paying the insurance, the health inspections, the food bills, the fuel costs, the, you know, dumping fees and all that out of my per pocket, out of my personal money. Okay. So it's it's one of, it's all depends on how in you're in. I'm in. If you believe in what you're doing, right, and you think you have an idea of what you're going to create off of whatever that initial debt may be, you know what I'm saying? If, you, if it's well thought out and, and you look at even take all the, the negative side as well. I mean, you have to look at this well-rounded approach. If you believe in it and you have an idea of what you're going to generate off of this, 
And, uh, you know, then, yeah, I mean, I would do it. I, I would go into debt probably to start it, but I'm not in the restaurant business either. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so it all comes down to that. It's, it's your own work ethic and how much you, your desire to do whatever it is and how you push through things. It's going it's to be tough. It's, the minute that you take that loan or whatever it may be or start ha have that debt, it's going to weigh on you all of the time. I promise you. So we have a couple minutes left, and I need a final remark to, in your okay. schedule. Okay, I got one more question. Um, okay. All right. Do you want me to go? I was just going to ask you about marketing. Like, how much money do you put in educating people that your business is out there, and how? What have you found to be the most successful? Well, first, the first time around, I spent a lot of money on marketing, but it was also before social media. So this time. I spend very little on marketing because I use social media. I, I spend zero on marketing. Yeah. We should use all social media. We, we, spend money I spend we didn't spend anything either. Yeah, I spend money on the person who updates my website and social media. Yeah, uh, I have to pay my wife money that. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Stella? Um I don't spend uh, any money on marketing. I've placed one ad at the Bucks County Herald in three years. Um, when I do marketing, it's all through events. I give product away, like this past week, I did the Epicurean Palette Grounds for Sculpture. We had uh, a little over a thousand people come by our stall, probably about 200 of which knew about the restaurant, the other 800 never ever heard of it. And they all left with business cards, they all left with food, and hopefully they all left with smiles. But, um, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of marketing. The only kind of marketing I'll do is if I know I have some form of direct result, like I'm never going to take out an ad in a magazine, or if I do take out an ad in a magazine, I'll couple it with some form of offer so I know when people are coming in. It's not about the offer to attract people, but that way I know what I'm getting out of it. And I can sit down and be like, you know, I got this many customers, this is how much it cost me, is it worth it for me to do that, you know? Um, but generally speaking, I'm not a big fan of, of, of magazine ads and things like that because, you know, they tend to be full of restaurants and what's, you know, what is there to differentiate you from everybody else? Whereas if you're giving somebody your food um, and you own a restaurant, you know, food is what you do. So, um, yeah, I'd rather put my marketing on the plate. Yeah. Yes, that's what I, I want I, my marketing to be on the plate that you get when you're served. That's my market. I'm, yeah. I'm big on samples. Sample sell. Right. I yeah. um, will I I won't stick samples out on my serving area. <clears throat> that to me is just not sanitary. But I have no problem with somebody walking up to my truck going, "What's that? Can I get a taste?" Absolutely. Well, we, we we do a lot of marketing. Oh, well, I'm not in food business. Good. You got a different. You know, I got a different, different business. business. The thing is that business. what's important for us is to understand what you're generating. <clears throat> we talk about conversions all the time. Yeah. What am I converting to an actual sale? Right. You have to know your data underneath the business, and you're fine with it. This card here right now, this, 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 I know I get a 3.9% conversion rate on any on anybody who touches this card. So I know, you know, it's just a it's just yeah. a matter of numbers for me at that point. Um, you know, it's, we do a lot of social media and all that kind of stuff too. We also pay for some of the social media. We, we've done a lot. We spent a lot of money to pass our previous business on, and you make made some mistakes with that, and you learn from it. The beautiful thing that I have right now is we have an in-house graphic designer. So we're able to put stuff out in seconds, in quality stuff. And then uh, you know, the more business you do, the better deals you get and so forth. But I think that if you're going to spend money on marketing, you better know the, 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 the underlying or the data that goes along with it. If you're in food, really, to me, I, I, I love restaurants. I love food. The best way for someone to know about that food is if it was good, if I had good service. Because I'm going to tell someone else. That was, that was, that was I just wanted to say that um, the second half of my career, I worked seven hours a day, five days a week. I had three, four managers to run the operation. And I had a good life, and I owned a restaurant. Which I'm just worried we're not hearing that so much around here, okay? I was walking around, I was 38 years old, I say, how can Howard Johnson own 100 restaurants? He's never in any of them, and I got to be in this restaurant every damn day of the week all day. That was like my mantra, how, how, how? How can I do this so it's reasonable? Well, to me, the key is volume. I worked on building my volume. When I did enough volume, I could hire an assistant manager. Then more volume, I could hire another manager. So you can build yourself into a good life in the restaurant business. I just want to share that with you. My question is, to the gentleman right there in the middle. Like how you said, um, two years ago you could have been in the food, mm -hmm, food, um, food show. Yeah. At my church, I make salad dressing. Mm -hmm. 
but they keep everybody like it and they don't want to buy salad dressing from the store anymore. But personally, I don't feel ready right. to start making it a full-time thing because people call me with orders and I have to turn them down. Is that like the smart thing to do or should I take like a percentage of my customers? Like, because I personally feel like I'm still in school and stuff like that. Right. I don't well, want to pull them off. Salad dressings are uh, tricky. <clears throat> like, is it refrigerated? Is it not refrigerated? Is, mm -hmm. Does it have... Is it stable? I mean, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered mm -hmm. before you are ready to go to market. You know, you're going to need a commercial kitchen to make it. Which I don't. Do you have a commercial kitchen available? No. Okay. So that you need that. You're going to need to contact the Department of Agriculture. They're going to have to come inspect. You're going to have to have your product tested in the lab. So there's a lot of steps before you get to even selling it at a farmer's market. So never mind going to a food show. So No, I was yeah. just asking that since you mentioned that I don't feel ready with right. myself to say, okay, right. I do it. And you listen to that. Like that. Yeah. yeah. That's a good voice to listen to. You'll know. Yeah. You'll know. Yeah. yeah. Another thing I, I wanted to mention just from my own point of view is um, I'm not the most organized person in the world. I never have been. <laughs> and I think that in the last three years I've really had to teach myself how to get organized. Um, you cannot overplan and you cannot overorganize. And one of the things that I spend many hours a week now are just trying to figure out systems for the restaurant. You know, I'm writing a, a book right now on our restaurant. Everything. I mean, from how to turn the lights on and off to, you know, our procedures if somebody shows up late. You know, I'm really just working right now to try and organize every facet of what we're doing. And um, it's kind of like that Starbucks mentality, you know what I mean? Like you take a customer's order, you ask them their name, they've got a set greeting, they've got a set way they make the drinks. And that's one of the reasons why they're successful is because they're organized and they're consistent. And if you can't get organized, you're never going to be consistent. And that's what people look for, I feel like, when they're um, you know, patronizing a business. So I feel like for organizing my business, it's really, it's kind of started out by organizing myself, you know? and. Uh, I have, you know, maybe 40, 50 checks that I write every week to various different people, trying to make sure I stay on top of that, you know, keep my invoices in some form of order, um, and keep on top of stuff, because uh, it will it yeah. really, it will sink important. you so quickly. Very important. So, it's about 125. Uh, how many people have class at 1.30? Oh, yeah. Okay. You want to teach yourself? Quick. Yeah. And then, <laughs> <laughs> you guys leave it, hang out. Until two o'clock, if you sure. wanted to chat with you one on one. Sure. Okay. So. Yeah. Uh, real quick, so we talk about marketing. Just so you know that you know another thing we did. Pre we're trying to create buzz with everything we do. Is that uh, we had a birthday bash for a store celebrating one year. So we're getting information out there, and we actually invested in scratch off tickets for our customers, which are pretty cool. They're, they're real scratch off tickets, and they're rewards on every single purchase that comes to the store. Something like this, believe it or not, is going to generate so much interest after that. They'll probably get 27,000 hits and shares on Facebook. And the revenue that day and the next six months, you know, the compounding numbers going to be huge. So if it can work, if you have a, you know, if you kind of zero in on, on what your goal is for, you know, for something like this. So, you know. Do you want to tell them where your stores are? Uh, one's at Summit Square between Langhorn and Newtown. Uh, you know where the giant is? It's right there. It's right there. You guys have all your business cards. And yes. Stuff right one's at Ben Sound, one's on Malvern, and uh, one's yeah, at the Golf Day. Keep it for the future. Real quick. Yeah, sure. The other thing is you won't get rich quick. Yeah, I'm not going to get rich quick.